What do you remember about the day that you were in court and the and pleaded? I don't know. I was numb, just cold. It was it was also confusing. It was, didn't know enough about the system and how things worked. And I guess I understood what was about to happen, but I guess there's always something deep down that some miracle could happen. I don't know. I mean, the judge has the final say, right? Helen and Neil stood side by side in a courtroom in Edmonton on March 19th, 2020. It was the very early days of the pandemic in North America. Earlier that week, the courts had almost completely shut down. Neil's lawyer appeared by phone because he just returned from the United States and was in isolation. That was a new thing then. Helen and Neil had agreed to take plea deals. The murder charges would be dropped against both of them, and Helen would plead guilty to manslaughter instead. There would be no trial, no battered woman defense. The lawyers also proposed sentences. Helen would get 18 years in prison for the death of her husband. Neil would get three years for helping dispose of his father's body. Wes's charges had already been dropped. That was the deal. But the judge didn't have to accept it. Even with an agreement by the lawyers, it's still up to the judge to determine an appropriate sentence. It's rare for a judge to go against a plea deal, but it does happen. I've seen it. That's what Helen is talking about when she said there could be a miracle. The judge has the final say. He could give Helen as little as four years in prison, the minimum sentence for manslaughter with a firearm. I've seen that, too. I'm Jana Pruden, and this is In Her Defense from The Globe and Mail, Episode 6. Thanks, gentlemen. In the beautiful world, why did I... And don't get me wrong, because I'm not saying Darren's a bad person at all. He's a great lawyer. Yeah. It's just how things played out, I guess. And, you know, I, you know there's lots of things that I don't know either that happened behind the scenes. So, mm-hmm. But you, at some point it was decided not to take it to trial. Yes, like it wasn't totally my decision. Um, like I was heavily influenced not to, but at the same time, I'm not so sure whether I could have gone through that. It was just different. Um, When Kevin was representing me, I think it was, he was more supportive of helping me through it. Whereas with Darren, I I didn't have that confidence that I could do it. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just myself that I was concerned about. I, I wasn't concerned about myself. You know, <clears throat> I'm in this position, and uh, of course, to make it completely go away would have been the, the best option, but regardless of the fact, I can deal with whatever comes my way, mm-hmm. but I somehow needed to free Neil from it. It was... That was my biggest my biggest concern. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't his thing. He really had no part of it, other than being at the wrong place at the wrong time type of thing. And he was just standing behind his mother. And I just I, I couldn't take the the gamble on his part. Like on my part, I was willing to take the gamble, but I. I don't know. I just, I couldn't have lived with myself if, you know, things would have went badly and 
We both would have went to jail for first degree murder. So if if we imagine a situation in which Neil, you know, had had nothing to do with this uh, at all, meaning was never charged for it, mm-hmm. or like it's completely outside of the situation, and it was only you, you feel like you would have gone to trial for sure. Absolutely. I really didn't have anything to lose. And why would you have taken it to trial? I guess going into it, it would be the whole scenario would have been different because it, I guess I would have just expected the jury and the people involved to be more sympathetic. I guess it was the only way that I could feel that I could protect Neil, like to, to get the best for Neil. That's, that was my biggest concern. I'm, I didn't think there was any way of making it any better. I mean, that what he ended up with was like black and white from the start. I mean, it's still horrifying to think that he had to go to jail for even a day over any of this. The lawyers had drawn up a six-page agreed statement of facts. This is a version of events that becomes the truth, at least according to the court. Crown Prosecutor Dallas Sopko read it into the record. It talked about the family's financial problems, about Helen's depression and her attempts to take her own life, and what was described as a problematic family relationship. It said the 27-year marriage involved many incidents of physical and emotional abuse, including controlling behavior directed at Helen, and that Helen genuinely feared for her safety. It said, The accused was unhappy in her marriage, but due to the history of abuse, concern for her children, depression, and a learned helplessness, she felt she could not leave. The court heard that on the September long weekend in 2011, Miles was very drunk, ordering Helen and Neil around at gunpoint, throwing wrenches at Helen, and threatening that she would pay dearly for a broken-down tractor. It said Miles' behavior got worse throughout the day and only stopped when he passed out. It said Miles was sleeping when Helen got a twenty-two caliber revolver pistol and shot him in the back of the head, killing him instantly. The case was adjourned until the fall. In the meanwhile, Helen packed up the house and farm and prepared to go to prison. It was a tough few months. Michelle Pruden worked with Helen at A1 at the time. If you noticed the last name, she's actually married to a distant relative of mine, but we don't know each other. And so when she was charged and out on bail, were you back working here then? Yes. Yeah, okay. I was here with her right till the end. Right. She kind of trained me to take back over. Right. Yeah. So what was that period like when she kind of... Um... I felt for her, I was actually very scared that she was going to end up doing something bad to herself, just because. But again, she was very quiet, not, I'll be honest, the openest I seen her was the night when we all had a few drinks tonight, mm-hmm. her last night, and um, she just kind of said that she didn't regret what she did, and she'll do what she's got to do to, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so that was the night before she was actually sentenced and taken into custody. Yeah. And uh, can you just tell me a little bit about, was that actually in the it store? Was. We, yeah. We closed up and we just had a few beer and uh, talking, visiting. And yeah. she, she knew that the next day she was going to yeah. prison. Yeah. And what was that, like, what was that like for you to see that and know? It was horrible. Absolutely horrible. I couldn't even imagine, like, yeah, being in her shoes, right? Mm -hmm. You've you've lived a life of hell up to here, and now you're going to have to continue to live a life of hell. Helen and Neil were back in court on October 30th, 2020. We can't play recordings from court, but we do have the transcripts. Crown Prosecutor Dallas Sopko said there were a lot of aggravating factors in the case— including, and this is a quote, that this occurred in the victim's own home, 
a place where he's entitled to feel safe. Helen's lawyer, Darren Sprake, said the deal came from a year-long negotiation. He did mention the extreme control and violence Helen was living with, including Miles's quote, gunplay. He said the central issue for the defense was whether or not the battered woman syndrome would apply. This was the struggle for the defense in that respect, he said. I'm not alleging any particular circumstances. That means as far as the court was concerned, Helen's abuse was irrelevant. Helen didn't speak. Justice Sterling Sanderman presided over the case. He was about to retire after a long career. And before he told Helen and Neil what their sentences would be, he reflected on the various tragedies that happen in the courthouse building every day. He said, Most people who are charged with criminal offenses in this building aren't evil people. They're not bad people. They are people who make mistakes because they are generally overwhelmed by their personal difficulties. They react poorly when other options are open to them, but they then have to pay for the manner in which they've overreacted because it offended our sense of morality and our sense of the law. The judge called Helen and Neil prime examples of that, law-abiding and loving people who haven't been able to deal with problems in their lives. He said they were going to lose their liberty for a period of time because they did something terrible, but that is the only terrible thing they have done in their lives. But Justice Sanderman's sympathy for Helen and Neil went only so far. Before he imposed the sentences, he said killing Miles was a callous, cowardly act on a vulnerable victim in his own home by a partner. He accepted the lawyer's deal just as it was. Helen was sentenced to 18 years in prison, minus four months for the time she spent in jail and under house arrest. Neil got three years with the same credit. The judge commended all the lawyers for their fine work. Thanks, gentlemen, he said. Then it was over. Uh, just, I guess, an easy one to say. I mean, do you have any sort of thoughts on the, the case now that it's concluded? Um, I think that the outcome was a just one for everyone involved, which is always satisfying for the Crown. It's been a long and arduous journey, particularly for the family. So um, I am satisfied and happy that the matter is dealt with on behalf of everyone that was involved in the matter, including the family, as well as the deceased. Crown Prosecutor Dallas Sopko wouldn't speak to me for this podcast, but here he is talking to Edmonton Journal reporter Johnny Wakefield on the courthouse steps after the sentencing. Very little as you get through life and you experience life, not very much is black and white. White, Obviously taking someone's life from the Crown's perspective is black and white in that sense, but, but the background and the relationship between the parties clearly isn't black and white, it's gray. And uh, uncovering what's going on in someone ho- someone's house can be difficult. And because this was a domestic situation, there's a lot that we don't know. And there's a lot about the dynamic between the uh, victim and the accused that we don't know. Have you, I mean, watching uh, Mrs. Nadler walk into court today was really difficult. I mean, she's a very small person. She's 56 years old. She was you know, being supported by her, her family. I mean, have you seen a defendant quite like this? I mean, she was... Um, it's it's unusual. Uh, it's unusual in my experience for people at this uh, age of their life, and particularly uh, a woman, to to commit uh, such a violent offense. I'm not trying to stereotype. I'm just saying that based on my experience. But that just goes to show what the domestic relationships can be like, and the dynamic in these places. Uh, and when conflict happens, sometimes people that don't otherwise commit criminal offenses do. And I'm not trying to minimize what happened. It was serious. Um, the victim had a, had other family members that really cared about him. But it is a real tragedy all the way around, as was said by Justice Sanderman in his decision. The judge's reaction, he made some comments. Yeah, um, that I'm not too keen on, but very good note. 
something that's totally out of my control. Like, yeah, he didn't have much of a heart, no. When he said those words and, and, you know, there's particularly a line about an innocent man, you know, being killed as he slept yeah. in the safety of his own home. Do you remember what it was like to, to hear those words and what your reaction was? Oh, yeah, I definitely remember, but uh, my reaction, I don't know if I... <laughs> I don't know what I should say there. Um, I don't know. It was kind of made me angry because just again, nothing was out there. Right? Nobody knew the real truth of what it was like. Those words seem very cruel to me to the experience that you had lived. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, they were cruel, were they not? I don't know. But there again, nobody knew. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what to say there. I mean, how, really, how could he speak any differently when he didn't know the other side of the story at all? Helen's family and friends tried to process the idea of her facing nearly 20 years in prison. Here's Lawrence from the Holden Hotel. I didn't think she'd ever get a sentence like that. That was a big mistake. And Helen's friend and neighbor, Corlene LeClaire. I mean, that's the law, right? Yeah. What are you going to do? If it happened, it happened. And they are going to charge her, yeah. But I don't think she should have got such a sentence because of what went on in life. Like, he drove her to that, seriously. Do you remember when you heard what the sentence was going to be? That she was facing 18 years? I did hear, because a lot of people actually, because it was on Facebook and people were, Zoom, were at, telling me and saying that they didn't think it was right. All, like a lot of my friends around in the horse pe- world, they, think, they thought it was crazy. Anyway, I've never talked to anybody that thinks she should have got what she got. Helen's co-worker, Michelle Pruden, was hearing the same things. That it was wrong. It was way too much. That she did not deserve that. More or less, I've heard many people say he deserved to be where he he was. Mm -hmm. I can't say I heard one person say that she got what she deserved. Mm -hmm. Not one person. And then when I found out what she got, I was just horrified. Yeah. Because it's more like self-defense, whether you look at it that way or not. She lived her whole life at and it wasn't just people who knew Helen who were upset. I was fuming when I read the judge's comments. I found them condescending. I found them arrogant. And I found them ignorant. How can you say there were other options? Do you not know about the plight of rural women escaping male violence against women? Do you not know about battered women's syndrome? Have you not looked at the case law? You've been a judge for decades. This is Matthew Behrens. He's part of a group called Women Who Choose to Live. His comments were just beyond the pale. And the notion that Helen's husband, the abuser, was the ultimate victim here, that, again, it's, I don't know what words can express how otherworldly those comments are. They literally are from another planet because this guy has no clue at all about what Helen went through. Um, And he didn't ask the questions he should have asked. Helen was railroaded and he let her get run over. Dr. Elizabeth Sheehy, the expert on the battered woman defense, also heard about Helen's sentence. Uh, I, I was well and truly shocked. It's the longest sentence I've ever seen for a, a, an abused woman who's pled guilty to manslaughter. And it's well outside the range. The longest sentence I'd ever seen was, I think, nine years. So this is double what I had considered an outlier sentence of nine years. So I thought it was quite shocking in, in spite of the uh, some of the aggravating circumstances. And, you know, the main aggravating circumstance 
in my view, is the fact that she lied about uh, about his death and um, you know participated in a in a in hiding his death from police for a period of six years. And I suppose the other thing is, you know, I looked at a comparable case of a man who had killed his wife and hidden her body in the wall, and his sentence was far less than hers. I, I, so even looking at, you know, men who kill, I thought, wow, this is really, really extreme and punitive as a sentence. She's referring to the case of Alan Scheibach, a Calgary man who strangled his wife, Lisa Mitchell, to death in October 2012. Scheibeck said his wife had been coming at him with a knife and that he strangled her in self-defense. He then cemented her body into the basement and sent fake texts and voicemail messages to her family and her children, making it seem like she'd run off with another man. He was convicted of manslaughter after a trial in Calgary in September of 2017, right around the time Helen was charged. He got seven years in prison fully 11 years less than Helen's 18-year sentence. Even though the Court of Appeal later increased his sentence to 10 years, Helen's sentence was still way higher. I'm not sure how to account for the difference, except the justice system is very used to men who kill their wives. It is not used to women like Helen. Well, the usual ending is her death, not his. I mean, all the data tells us that. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that that was definitely going to happen. How can I know that? But we certainly know that it's far more likely to end in her death than his, statistically. Not just statistically, but practically when you look at it, you know. I mean, he was twice her weight, um, at least a foot taller than her, and far more adept and prepared to use violence. He'd been using violence against her and her children for decades, you know, so I would say on her facts, certainly far more likely that he would kill her than she him. In 2011, the year Miles was killed, almost half of female homicide victims in Canada were killed by their current or former partners. For men, that number was 3%. After her sentencing, Helen was taken to the Edmonton Institution for Women. She told me those early days were some of the darkest and loneliest of her life. But she wasn't alone, even if she didn't know it yet. Can you tell me about that time, you know, from when you um, get this sentence and maybe you're sort of resigned that that's what you're facing. And then when you start to realize that there's a lot of people around the entire country who are saying this is wrong. It really messed me up. Yeah. I, I didn't know what to think at that point. I didn't know whether I'd done something wrong by agreeing to the deal or that I should have gone to trial or what was to happen next. And then, you know, then it uh, all started with this. Well, it started with a lawyer from Vancouver phoning. I had no idea. It just really caught me blindsided. I don't know how her call ever got through, to be honest. (laughs) A lawyer from Vancouver? Yeah, wanting to appeal the case, conviction, sentence, the whole thing. I had no idea who she would. Never heard of her in my life. And then what did you think? <laughs> I didn't know. That. I was just, I, it was just mind boggling because I had, I was terrified. I had no idea what was going on. I, I'm stuck in here, can't talk to anybody. And then I, I'm not knowing who to talk to, but I, I mean, it's not something I am not just going to take this person from out of the middle of nowhere that I've never heard of before and take her word for it. I, I was just, I didn't know what to do. So my, I, 
I relied on Darren. I, I called Darren and I, I just followed his advice. Um, called him to say like... Well, to find out what the hell was going on. Because like I said, I'm locked up in here. I don't see the news. I don't know what's going on with all this public reaction or what people are saying or... At that point, I didn't know who to trust. Yeah. I, I, like, I, I didn't know this other person, so the only person I really knew that I could kind of depend on was Darren. So I, at that point, I took his advice. I, he advised against it, and what am I supposed to do? I, right. But then that's not the end of it, obviously. So what happens then? <laughs> Well, then I get, that's when Kim gets in contact, Kim Pate, Senator yeah. Kim Pate. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it just changed from there. She kept in contact with me and kept me up to date as to what was going on and, you know, to give me information about other people that she'd been talking to, that, you know, her reasonings for why she was thinking that an appeal should be done and... <laughs> and there again, I thought, well, I'm, if everybody can guarantee me, there's that scary word again. <laughs> <laughs> that Neil's not going to be in any worse position. Like I said, there at, the, at that time, there again, it was his concern was my one and only main concern. <laughs> like I needed that, that guarantee, that reassurance that if things went badly or that nothing could change on his side of the fence. So, you know, you're in this strange place, very hard sometimes to get any information. A woman calls you out of the blue from BC, and then a senator calls you. From, <laughs> like, do you remember when you got on the phone with Kim and, you know? Not really, no. Right. Not, not okay. the first phone call. <laughs> yeah. Um, but from Kim, you learn that there is a lot of people in the country paying attention to this yeah, and a lot and of... It, uh, and, yeah, and then from there on, it just got to be more and more, like I think it was... But to start with, I got, then I got a, finally got a letter from that Matthew Bar Barons. Hmm. Okay, and then in his letter, he, you know pointed out a lot of situ the situations that were going on the, on the outside and all the these influential people that are out there concerned about the situation and wanting me to go through with this appeal and such. And then I had gotten a letter from Elizabeth Sheehy herself and, and it just, and it felt weird. Like, why are all these people that are so important, so worried about somebody like me that isn't important at all. But even if she wanted to go ahead with an appeal, and even if people around the country disagreed with her sentence, doing anything about it was almost impossible. That's next time on In Her Defense. There were very strong feelings uh, about there being an injustice and uh, on the face of it, that seemed to be a justifiable criticism, and Helen had nothing else. What the, you know, what is going on here? How could someone enter a plea deal and get 18 years for manslaughter in a situation of uh, where it was clear there was violence against women? Well, I guess maybe it's not a crazy feeling after all to think that you shouldn't get the shit kicked out of you and mentally abused all your life, that that's wrong. In Her Defense is made by Kasia Mihailovic and me, Jana Pruden. Field recording by Amber Bracken. Special thanks today to Edmonton Journal reporter Johnny Wakefield for sharing his interview on the courthouse steps. We may not even know about Helen's case if it wasn't for Johnny's reporting. In Her Defense is recorded at McEwen University by Sheena Rossiter, Emily Rubita, and Sasha Stanoyevich. David Crosby mixes the show. Angela Pichenza is our executive editor. 
Special thanks to Head of Visual Journalism, Matt Frainer, and Head of Editing, Ian Bokoff. Our theme song is The Fighter by Jen Grant, arrangement by David Crosby. I would love to hear from you. You can email me personally at jprudeen at globeandmail.com. To learn more about this podcast and domestic violence in Canada, go to tgam.ca slash inherdefense. That's defense the Canadian way with a C. While you're there, you can sign up for our true crime podcast newsletter. If you're experiencing domestic violence and want to talk to someone, you can find resources and your nearest shelter at sheltersafe.ca. To support journalism like this, consider subscribing to The Globe and Mail. Our listeners get a special discount on new subscriptions at www.globeandmail.com slash podcast deal. Take care and thank you for listening. Thank you.